really pleasure for me to be here in Toronto. I'm doing this presentation called Context Aware Adaptation of User Interfaces. I would like to share with you some spikes. Not some spikes for the fire over there, but some spikes to your imagination on how we could better adapt user interfaces for all your applications, whether it is for, for the web, for runtime applications, or whatever. So during this presentation, I'd like to show you maybe some examples that you already have seen, or some others that you have probably not yet seen so far. Actually, before lunch, there was somebody who raised the question, what can you do with Arabian languages? I don't know what's that person. Uh, maybe, ah, uh, okay. So this gives me the perfect introduction to my talk. What do we do if we have to ship our application with user interfaces for people speaking Arabian language? So let me show you here a potential answer to that. If I can switch. Ah. Okay, it's over there. So it's over there. So here on the right you can see a Java-based application for a car, simple, very simple car rental application. And this is the English-speaking version. So nothing, no, the French-speaking version, or sometimes no, the English one, so nothing secret. You can pick your car, the color you want, whatever. You can even shrink, expand the window depending on the size of your platform. But now let's imagine that you want to switch to a real language. So you flip the user interface and you get the Arabian one at runtime with the labels translated. So it's not just right to left or left to right, it's also translating the English to Arabian and also changing the user interfaces according to your user. For instance, um, you can provide the user with more or less options or you have to reshuffle the, the layouts, you have to change the widgets. So here is something that we, we can do here. Another example of that um, it's here. If you really want to see it, it's also on YouTube. Uh, so you have a kind of controller where you can flip your user interfaces and change the language depending on what your preference. So you can, of course, <laughs> shrink it, expand it, or you can even flip it vertically if you really want to do so changing the order of the question. So here it's a polling application. Or you can, of course, you can still input some information inside. So the application does not change. It's not different versions. It's only one simple code. And you can just change the layout or change the language that you want at one time. And sometimes you can even have both English and Arabian, because not all the time the Arabian language can be uh, found in the automatic translation. So here, of course, is a particular type of um, adaptation to user interfaces. Um, Okay, a few words about uh, myself. I'm leading the Louvain Interaction Lab about human-computer interaction. Uh, I'd like also to take this opportunity to, to recommend you very, something very interesting is that uh, last year we released a recommendation by W3C about abstract user interfaces. So if you have a chance to look at it, everything that you will see in this talk is based on that recommendation to some extent. So since last year, W3C has released a very first version on how to address these issues at the user interface level. Um, so what is adaptation? Well, in principle, it's very simple. We are users, so instead of we, as human beings, we should adapt to the computer, it is the computer that needs to be adapted to what we are doing. But it's very difficult because, of course, we, have, we are all different and we are not all that different from one person to another. So we need to take that into account 
as much as possible. So what we can do is, of course, we can change a lot of things in the user interface. And it's not because we change things that the user interface will be better or more usable or will provide end user with more experience. So here in this talk, I'd like to, to show you a few examples about uh, this kind of thing. So first of all, one single user interface, unfortunately, does not fit all. And it's not because we have different languages, different platforms, different modalities, or different preferences, or different maybe uh, willingness to, to use or not, that we should have very different user interfaces as well. Uh, so depending on three things, we can still do manageable things. I call that a context of use. A context of use consists of three things. The user, who I am, with my preference. Uh, for instance, as you can see, since I'm tall, I'm, I cannot adapt myself to any car. For instance, I remember that the first car I bought, it was really, really difficult to drive. Today, it's, it's quite more adapted to me, and not the inverse. Um, platform, what kind of device do we use? And in what kind of environment are we? For instance, if we are using this environment, can we take benefit from it? So I call that a context of use. It's a three things. Who is the user? What type of platform? And in which environment are we? Uh, what's the situation today? Today, we know that basically our environment, like for instance this room, does not change much, unless some exceptional events. <laughs> we are all users, so fortunately we are human, we always evolve very gracefully. Even if we don't notice, we are probably the most adaptable per uh, uh, person in, in the world. Our platforms, like our devices, smartphones, tablets, etc., also do evolve, but not so fast. What is really, really fast evolving is the language with which we develop our applications. So it's not about just HTML, but all the other languages. So here, also in the presentation, I will show you different user interfaces that have been implemented with different languages, because they provide us with the capabilities to do what we want it to do. Um, we have to face a, a very wide diversity of users. Not only people who are so-called normal users, or able-bodied use users, but also people with disabilities. Think about people using computers with mental disabilities or motor problems. Um, we have also a variety of tasks that we can do with, with our um, devices. And even for one task, we can have very different paths. For instance, in this graph, as you can see on the left, if I want to buy an item from <coughs> any e-commerce application, maybe Amazon or whatever, if I'm doing that simple task on my desktop, I will do a particular path. If I'm doing the same task on my tablet or for, on my PDA, I would rather adopt a rather different path, even if the, the task is the same. If I'm doing exactly the same on my mobile phone, it will be quite different. So even if the task is the same, the way I will do it is quite different. And of course, we have a wide bunch of platforms, you all know that. Even this one is interesting, with three different displays connected to each other. Uh, what is also interesting is that, depending on the time of the day, we are using different platforms. If I'm waking up, I always use my smartphone to have a, a bit of the news. When I am going to work, I still use my smartphone on the train or on the bus. Well, when I am at office, I would prefer, of course, to have a more stable version of my platforms, like uh, a laptop or a desktop. And if I'm going back home, I would prefer to use probably my tablet and even sometimes on the sofa or on the bed. Maybe it's not the good one, anyway. Also, we have the chance today that we have much more interaction capabilities than in the past. I'm not just talking about uh, graphical tablets, gestures, imagine also freehand gestures. So I'm forgetting about all the keyboards. You can throw the, the keyboards. You can do body able interaction. Think of also about this is, of course, a very special one called palatal interaction. Palatal means you can use your tongue with a trackpad inside here. And surprisingly, our tongue is very, very accurate. So instead of using maybe your, your hands, you can move the cursor of your favorite application with the tongue. Of course, maybe it's not a, for an average user, but think about people who are tetraplegic, for instance. They can still move the tongue. So they can use that instead of traditional point and click or drag and drop. So we have to face many contexts of use, 
And of course, it's impossible to have one user interface for all of these contexts, or even to have many different user interfaces. So a few words about the beginning. What is adaptation? When we go through the complete life cycle of adaptation, we are going through different steps. Let's imagine, for instance, in, in Belgium, we, we speak three national languages, French, Dutch, and German. And of course, since not everybody speaks the three languages, we have to translate the interface even in more in English. So each time we have to ship an application, we have to deliver it with four different languages. So this is the first step. What is the goal? Second is that once you have stated what the goal is, how would you trigger the adaptation? For instance, would you prefer you as a user to, to choose your own language? Would you prefer to store that language preference on your browser? Or would you like to prefer the system that will detect that it is you using the system and that will take the best language for interacting with you? What do you prefer? Would it be the system? Would you prefer to you? Or would you like to store it? These are different preferences. So depending on your choice, you can specify that. This is the second step. First step, once you have stated that with the system, the system needs to store that and specify the action so as in the end it will apply the adaptation for you. And we will see some examples of that. So then the system performs the adaptation for you and after that you have the adapted interface. Here there is a first problem is that before adaptation you have one screen, after adaptation you have another one, but you have nothing between. So people are very puzzled, say, oh, yesterday I saw that screen and today I have this one. Why? What happened? What did I do wrong? So for this, we have different ways to improve. Like, for instance, one possible way is uh, doing what is called a user interface transition. If I can switch to that one. OK, not this one. Um, User interface transition means if I want to adapt the user interface at runtime, time, I would like to show the user how the user interface has been changed. So here is a very simple example of that. The user interface is adapted to a smaller screen, so the list box is reduced to a drop-down list. The two buttons are, of course, moved upwards to simplify the interface, and the window is resized. So here is a very simple explanation, and we have, oh, sorry, about that. that's the problem of YouTube, it's doing that automatically. So we can do that with a language that shows the user some animation before and after the user interface has been uh, adapted. So once you have seen the adaptation, you, you always raise your question, why it has been adapted, and does it fit my purpose? If yes, we can go to the other one, and then you can state maybe other goals. Otherwise, say, no, I'm not happy with that user interface. I want to change it. Maybe I want to change it by demonstration. Please change this, replace that. Or maybe you can ask the system, please change the user interface for me. So here are a few examples to start with, some more advanced adaptations. First, um, on the right here, you see a very simple user interface for numerical input, maybe on a keyboard. And if it's for any reason the, the user interface detects that your keyboard no longer works, then it automatically switches to that one, so that you can still at runtime time continue to input without any interruption, continue your task, no disruption. Or on the left, what you can do if you don't like this presentation, you left click, not right click, you left click on the presentation and you choose alternate presentation. For instance, if you don't like this dial, you can have it as a vertical parameter or a horizontal one or even another one. That's your own preference and the system stores that for you. Another very interesting uh, property is called plasticity. You can adapt things, for sure, but the most important is that you have to take into account the satisfaction of the user in the end. So we cannot adapt everything just for the sake of, of it, but in order to satisfy usability. <coughs> so here, for instance, is a, also another example of that. This simple application runs, runs on any platform and just display time and date. But depending on the size of the window, 
it will show the most appropriate version. So here is one, here is another one, maybe with the clock. Or even if you allow it with room enough to display the calendar, so you can see what day of the week we are. Or if you shrink it horizontally, you have only space to display the clock. Or if you have more space, you can have a combination. So this application, for instance, has 16 different presentations, and at runtime time, it shows the best presentation for you. So here is an example and how you can do that at one time. If it comes. So as you can see here, while I'm changing the size of the window, the user interface change accordingly. Of course here it is the system that does all the job for me. So maybe I'm not happy with the result, so I can fix it and say, okay, I would like to use this presentation now. As you can see, the calendar, for instance, is not increasing, so it's not responsive for that. The clock it is, but the calendar is not. Another example that I like very much from the early days of Nokia, when they had to deal with very different screen resolutions on their mobile phones, what they did was really interesting. Is that here you can use your you, you were able to use your Nokia. Uh, um, mobile phone as a remote control for your TV. And depending on the size of the window of your mobile phone, the system had this facility. <coughs> so again, it was embedded in one single application. So if, the, if your screen resolution changes, the user interface changes for you. For instance, showing you more options to control your uh, TV setup box or showing less options. So always depending on available space, it shows more or less options. Of course, it does not take into account your preference. For instance, that was the, the communicator or even the iPad style. And, uh, and again, if you move, you can see always a so small transition effects showing how the objects will move from one position to a target. So that's also interesting for explaining to the user what has changed. So usually we distinguish between adaptivity and adaptability. Adaptivity, the system does that for you, but the drawback is that since we delegate everything to the system, we are not always happy with that. On the other hand, we can adapt ourselves. This is adaptability. But then we are not so keen on spending time to adapt everything. So what we can do also called a mixed initiative. So by looking at what you are doing, the system can infer what type of adaptation you may want to do. At least I will skip for a moment. Um, another one. Graceful degradation is not only for network or for distributed computing. The idea is you start with a screen for, let's say, a desktop, and you gracefully downgrade the different widgets so as to reach other user interfaces for different other platforms, like, for instance, here for uh, a pocket PC. Or, and then you have transformation rules. For instance, the left items that were displayed as labels are automatically translated into icons. Or uh, the accumulator has been simplified into another widget dynamically. And you can do that by applying a transformation engine. And in the end, you have another running interface. So let me show you how this has been applied um, to a system for uh, emergency services. So the system was called Arthur. So the idea is that um, imagine that you have a person here arriving at an emergency service at the hospital. As you can see, this person is really suffering. Huh? It's an emergency. So the, the person is arriving at the hospital and is willing to be, of course, uh, examined by uh, a physicist. And here, in the past, as you uh, will see that in a minute, now, now today, oops. Okay, in the past, and you will see that on the right, in the emergency department, they had a big wall plate with paper labels, so I say, ah, this patient will move from that place to that place. So they have to move the label, or if they have to take an x-ray, they have another label, etc. 
So this is completely out of date. And now they have a wall screen showing what is the situation in the emergency department. So the situation is as follows. So each line represents a patient arriving at the emergency department. On the left, you can see the criticity color. If it is green, it's not very important, maybe like a broken arm or something like that. If it is blue, it's not that important. If it is blue, maybe uh, some wounds or bleeding, so needs some, some attention, but not that critical. Green needs really careful attention, and red is really critical condition. Of course, you as a patient, you don't see that, right? because otherwise you will be even more critical. These are only for the nurses and for the doctors. Um, the nice thing is that this screen, available on the wall screen, has been gracefully transformed into one for a pocket PC, a smartphone, a desktop, and a laptop. So we have five different computing platforms by applying transformation rules. So here now is the, the pocket PC version. So for instance, this physicist is now free. He is willing to take care of the new patient that has, has arrived. So he picks the new patient on the pocket PC, say, OK, I'll take care of you. Let's move to a so-called box, this is a box in the hospital language, where the physicist will examine the patient. A first diagnosis is uh, performed by the doctor. And in the past, instead of phoning, for instance, to the x-ray department, saying, ah, can you give me a, an x-ray slot for this guy? Now he's directly requesting an x-ray to the department by selecting some items on the pocket PC and by sending the request immediately to the x-ray department. So without returning back to the main room of the emergency department, and each time there is a new event, there is a new icon. You see, that's the wall screen that the very bad, as you can see, plate that was using in the emergency department before. So a document is being printed with the request, and our patient is moving to the X-ray department for taking the X-ray of the forearm, because he was playing tennis and maybe he fell down and maybe he broke some part of the wrist. And as soon as this x-ray is done, the icon is updated on the wall screen. So that it gives a real-time estimation of what's going on for all the patients at the emergency department. Now he's discussing with a colleague. And each time a new operation has been done, like for instance here, they put, I don't know the word in English, I'm sorry, but in French it's called ATEL, you know, to block the, the arm. In the meantime, as you can see, you receive a very nice pyjama from the hospital. <laughs> I don't know why, because he just broke in his wrist for so blood sampling. So each time there is a new operation, a new icon is automatically generated on the wall screen so as to give accurate information in real time. And there were a lot, a lot, a lot of icons because Medical acts in an emergency department, there are many, as you can see. So this, we, it took us three years to do that. Not just icons and all systems. So by applying uh, transformation rules, we adapted user interfaces without changing it by hand, but by letting the system doing that for, for us uh, for different platforms. So we use transformation rules, like for instance, this uh, accumulator can be reduced by this one, for instance, if you remove the labels, or it can be shrunk vertically if you need some more space if you are on a mobile platform, on a tablet, or even using another style that is not so consistent, or even another one until a, a tiny one, but that's the, less, the least usable one. Um, very interestingly, this one has been used for adapting a month selection in the US, because of course, as you can see, Independence Day is in July, so we have the American flag. You have the pumpkin for Halloween in October. So this is very much adapted to American one. But if you are using, if your targets are users from any other country, this is no longer adapted for instance, because it does not make sense for these people. So we have to rely on other uh, non-iconic uh, representation. 
Even if you shrink that, you can come up with smaller and smaller parts, but of course they are less usable than before. Uh, another one, migration. Now imagine that for any reason, I am using my laptop here, and for any reason, I have to move, and I cannot take my laptop with me. I want to switch, or I want to migrate things from my computer here, and to my platform that I'm using in a mobile way. So here is the first example, for instance. Let's imagine that I have to paint something. If you look at the painter, the painter has, of course, the painting canvas, and he's using a lot of tools around. If you look at uh, any painting application, this is what you have. You have only a small screen to paint, and you have a lot of tools, bar, a lot of menus, a lot of icons, a lot of brushes, and not, maybe not all adapted. So why don't we use, for instance, the main areas or your main screen for painting, and you delegate everything onto your own pocket PCs, smartphones, or tablets at runtime? So for instance, if you see there are some correspondence, right? you have all the tools that you want to paint, that's nice. But instead of consuming too many space or too much space in the meanwhile, in the center, you want to move that to other things. So here is an example. At one time, you may want to move your toolbars, your menus, your icons, whatever you want, to another device, like for instance here, a pocket PC or a smartphone or a tablet. So here is how it works. So let's start the painting application. It's a, it's a simple vector here painting application, so you can draw uh, things as you wish. So here, random curve. You can change, you can grab it, you can change the size, the color, whatever. And suddenly you want to adapt this user interface and you move the toolbar outside the main area of that application. It still works. You can get rid of the, the color bar as well. And here you say, yes, but that already exists, right? With our point, for instance, you can delegate or move your toolbar outside. Yes, but it's on the same platform. Now imagine that you are using another platform with another operating system. Can you do that? So here with this system you can. So uh, let me show you now between different platforms. Sorry for the bad video. So on the right, you, well, you have two different computers. The only constraint is that they are linked to each other with the same local area network, or it would be a wireless network. On the right, you have the application running. So these are really two different computers, not just two screens connected to the same computer. And at some point, you want to maximize or you want to adapt your user interfaces depending on the, the screen real estate that you have. So you move, toolbar on the left. We can also move the color toolbar from right to left. There it is. Or you can even merge them while continuing to work. So this works with Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. So even if you are using another operating system, it doesn't matter. The system still works. So basically, this is how it works. You have the main window of your application. So you, you want to get rid of those toolbars that consume screen space. So you move them on the left. One bar, two bars, or even you can then classify. You mean you want to regroup these toolbars into one single. This is called classify. For instance, here the system tries to relay out the uh, interface objects for you and then merge them into one single user interface, this is it, here on a pocket PC. And while running, of course, it, you don't need to stop the application for doing so. So this is not a real floating toolbar, as you can have maybe on PowerPoint or any other uh, drawing application, because it is called migration. You migrate one part of the user interface from right to left, 
And these are two different processes on two different computers. So there are many things that you can, of course, adapt. You can adapt the contents, you can adapt the presentation, you can adapt the, uh, the navigation. I will not cover all of them, but only a few of them that I think. So here, for instance, here is a user model that we can rely on in order to adapt user interface, depending on the preference. It could be many parameters, as you can see. But of course, it does not mean that we have to take them into account all at once. We can adapt the presentation, which means the static aspect, or we can adapt the navigation be between. Uh, there is a lot of possibilities. I will show you that in a minute. You can also adapt the contents. For instance, if you have an image or if you have a video, you can, of course, apply graceful degradation, like cropping, resizing, centering, um, changing the resolution, depending on the bandwidth. There are already very good systems that do that while you surf on the web. They try to uh, recover the, the same contents, but try to adapt depending on your bandwidth. Behind that, you can have a lot of adaptation moves, like if you are using this computer, if you are using that resolution, if you have that preference, then please use this interface. The problem is that there is a combinatorial explosion. If you have many possibilities like that, you have many adaptation possible. So here is a design space. I will not explain everything. Um, OK, the first one that I would like to, to show is how, for instance, you can redistribute widgets for your user interfaces at runtime. So in the following example that you will see, we see a spreadsheet, and we will take some part of the spreadsheet out of this spreadsheet and recompose another user interface at runtime. So first part of it, we have here on this screen different uh, user interfaces, and we would like to merge them all at once. Here you can recognize the, the flex clock that we have seen some minutes before, right? Okay, now I'm launching um, a free space where I can compose a new user interfaces by dragging and dropping components from other user interfaces, for instance, now just the flex clock. Now I'm launching a, a graphing application, a simple one here. So graphs are attached to values. Of course, if I change the value, the graph histogram is changing its size depending on that. That's no secret. I can then move that to my application area so as to compose another one. And then finally, I will take Excel. It's still working. Okay. I can, of course, reshuffle things or resize depending on my my preferences. And now we will launch an Excel application where you have a spreadsheet and we will connect them all together. So here we write a very simple formula and with a sum. 10 plus 20 is of course 30. And then we pick this cell and we will migrate it into the other one. So there you have the cell with the formula and you have a big hole now in your spreadsheet. You have probably never seen a spreadsheet with a hole inside. And still working, so if you change this, any value in your Excel, that's here, and then as soon as the interface is updated, it is reflected in the other one. So you can recompose things, and of course you have an option to go back if you don't like that as well. For instance, here. <coughs> I'm continuing working, but then I, I would like to restore. So the cell that I have migrated to uh, my composing area, I want to restore it to Excel so that I no longer have any hole in it. And I want to restore everything as before adaptation. So here the example is that at one time, you can provide the user with the ability to relay out things by extracting parts of the user interface at one time and recomposing something better suited for her personal usage. And if you no longer want to use that, you just click restore and the system will restore the initial user interfaces for you. Uh, this I will skip because time is flying. Now, another thing that I like very much is 
can you see, for instance, the difference of a web page that you have seen some time before? So this is a very nice tool called Diffy, uh, which is interesting. Imagine that you have browsed a website, and you want to browse this web page once again. So from, the last, from your last visit, the system can automatically highlight what part of the user face has changed. So not only in the text or in the image, like for instance, this part or that part, or a picture, or also any other part of the user face that has changed since your last visit. Of course, you need to, uh, to install that plugin before. So this is very helpful for me because I don't want to reread what I've read before, and if something has changed, I can immediately check that. Another way is also to show adaptive, as you have seen before, for instance, from the left to right. If I say this user interface will change from a drop-down uh, to a drop-down list, we have a language behind that can be processed at runtime for uh, showing adaptation. Another example here. Now, also, how do we do? We usually try to gracefully downgrade. The other opposite side is progressive enhancement. How do we deal with very large screens? So we do that also by relayouting, but by applying the other rules for trying to optimize at one time the screen real estate. So let me show you here two examples of real applications where this is done. So the first application is again a car rental application. On the left, you can see it on a normal screen. And if for any reason you really want to have much more options on the car that you want to rent, or maybe you want to see more information, or you want to see more availabilities, you can expand the window onto the right screen, and then the system will, uh, where are we? Okay, there we are. There it is. And then the system will not only change the size of the objects, but will change the objects with more details, and reposition things dynamically depending on your window size and position. So here, this is just responsive design. But even more, after that, you can have more details being displayed. So once it is released, of course, you have the bezel of the two screens, which is not very nice. And here, as you can see, depending on also another strategy is reshuffling. As you can see, the objects on the interface are being repositioned depending on the size of the window. So if you have a more horizontal one or if you have a more vertical one, the system computes at one time the available screen space and does that the job for you. You can see how gracefully the things are moving. So this is a for a car rental system. And we have another example later on for picking a, choosing a, a DVD. On the left, you have a, a series of DVD recommendations, <coughs> depending on your profile, your preference, or your history. But you want to have more information on the potential DVD that you may want to rent. So instead of clicking, going to the DVD page, then closing, and then back, and then so forth, and back and forth, you can do that by just expanding the window. Expand it, and then you have the details. Expand it more, and you have even more details. Expand it even more. You can have then screenshots, or trailers, or rating bars. And if you want to play with the reshuffle, then the system can also reposition the different parts of the interface, as you can see here, or regroup them, or aggregate them depending on your size, <coughs> as you can see here. The colors indicate the potential preference of this type of movie depending on your profile. I don't remember the color, but this is the purpose. So the advantage of that is that the system does the job for you, but the drawback, as you can immediately see, is that all user interfaces are always different. So you may want to say, OK, maybe I like it because it's trying to optimize my screen space, but it always changes. That's not a very good thing.
Uh, last but not least, I would like now to show you also a real example of an application that you can actually download from, from App Store. It's called WalkAway. Let's imagine that you want to, to make a trip. For instance, you want to make a trip to Belgium or you want to make some visits. Of course, you want to take care of your route planning. This is the first application. The second, you want to take care about the weather. Is it raining? Uh, because we don't have the same temperature as you have here in Porto. So you want to, to check that before. Um, and you may also say, depending on the platform that you use, you want to have the recommendation or you have to have this information all at once. You don't want to go to the route planning first and then to the weather forecast, you want to have them all at once. And maybe depending on how you will do the trip, maybe with your car, with the train, <coughs> or why not with a bike, or even by foot, or with a <coughs> house, with a horse, then the user face can change accordingly. So here let me show you, we have three types of application. One is for route planning, this is called walk away. The second one is about weather forecast, and then you will see the merge of all of them into only one, which we call uh, warm weather or weather away, where you have the route planning and the temperature or the weather forecast as well. So you will see that this system um, adapts itself to the user profile, the, the platform, depending on what type of platform do I have, and in what circumstances I am. If I'm in the forest, maybe I'm a biker, or, a, or a, I'm driving a horse, or if I'm on the highway, then it's different. So for this, I will just show you, we have a large bunch of rules. It's impossible to code all of them with if then else rules. So we are using here decision table or decision matrix. So that, for instance, what you can see is depending on the screen resolution, <coughs> depending on the preference of the user, or if the user detects something, then a particular screen will be triggered. And we have a lot, a lot of them. For this application, we have more or less 200 different user interfaces that are not pre-coded, because if I have to code it myself in the code, it will be a mess. If I'm letting the system do that for me, maybe it's less messy. Uh, so the architectural approach, um, how does it work? So we have, of course, uh, different types of clients on the top left. Uh, we go through a proxy that detects not only the platforms, but also the preferences of the user, or is location aware, maybe if if I have a low speed, then maybe I'm walking. If I'm walking a little bit faster, maybe I'm a jogger. Or if I'm driving even faster, I'm driving a horse or whatever. And then it triggers some parameter from DDA, which is a repository of devices, gets some information from the web service, and repurpose everything at runtime, depending on that. So here is a first an example for the temperature. On the top left, you have the weather forecast for this user who only wants to have a weather forecast for two days in advance. If you are on the desktop, on the top right, you have space for displaying six days. But this guy is also interesting by having the rain predictions and also the pressure, because he's a, for instance, he's a jogger. Or the bottom left, for instance, person is willing to have the weather forecast for sailing a, a boat. So uh, again, depending on the profile, different information or add it and present it differently. Now, if I'm going to desktop, I'm connecting here, and I can check or uncheck all my preferences. Of course, this can be stored in a, in a preference file for once. I don't need to do that every time. And then I have the route planning. So as any route planning, you have the map. You can see points of interest, the closest route from one point to another, and whatever you want. Maybe you want to visit some nice Belgian restaurant, or you want to see uh, the Battle of Waterloo these days. So this is on the desktop. Of course, if you are on the move, ah, this is another version when, for instance, your system detects that the light is too high. So the background changes automatically, providing you with a more stable background. Uh, then you have also the route planning, and then you can have weather predictions as well. If now you connect also with your preferences for the weather forecast, you can say, depending on who you are, what are your preferences, it will display weather forecast in different ways. Uh, full screen on desktop. Or if I move now to a tablet, an iPad, or connecting here. And then this is the tablet version now. So I'm going with the weather forecast. And now it's just in the middle of the night. So the system detects that 
about the time, and then we change the background. If, yeah, if it is the same interface, but I'm using it under daylight condition, the system does that for you too. The route planning now, because I'm driving at night, again, the system changed that for me. I hope that the contrast is better. If it is daylight, the, the information is exactly the same, but only the background has changed. You can see the, 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 the route planning, etc., of course. And then you can also say now what type of point of interest you want to say, you want to see, and how you would like to display. So you can, of course, filter that, as usually on any routing application. Um, now, you want to have also weather forecast where you are. So not only the point of interest are displayed, but also all the weather forecast for all the points that you may want to go through. So not only you can say, OK, I want to do this trip, but also you can have some weather forecast when you will be there, it will be raining, yes or no. Or maybe you don't want to go there because it's raining. OK, this is the, again, the different versions. OK, in the end, why do we strive for adaptation? Is it good or yes or no? So here I have tried to show you some examples of adaptation. So usually it is always for the ultimate benefit of the end users. And it is empirically proved that if you do so, you will improve the subjective end user satisfaction, or you will improve the efficiency or the effectiveness. But the big drawback of that is there is always a disruption. When a user sees one user interface before adaptation and another one after adaptation, there is always a disruption. It is why things have changed. We don't like to change too much. We can change, but we don't like too much. So there is always a dis disruption. The other thing is that from the developer side, we have to deal with different variations. It's not that easy. For instance, if you say, if you want to collect bugs from the end users at runtime, you have to really know what type of user interface you have at that time, instead of you only using one thing at a time. So development cost and complexity that you can reduce with uh, some of the examples that I've seen, you know, the two I've seen. So now, just uh, to finish, uh, we have been trying to implement all of these things according to an XML language called UseXML, which stands for User Interface Extensible Markup Language. So it's an XML language, but that captures the user interface for you and then on which you can have the rendering system. So let me show you a video about that. I apologize because it's a, it's a video that has been uh, captured by the Belgian TV in French, but I hope that we'll catch the ID. d'un site web et à rendre plus universel certaines applications pour smartphones. On va se plonger tout de suite dans l'air numérique avec une angle. Un smartphone, une tablette ou encore une borne. Hein? Just to explain, so what you will see here is a real uh, application that we have developed for uh, the national Belgian uh, broadcaster called uh, Proximus Belgacom, where they had to deal with a lot of different platforms. This application was intended to provide users with feedback on what type of service what's available on their mobile phones, uh, platforms, or uh, tablets. And of course, there is a wide bunch of them. So everybody connects to that service. The system detects what can be done. And depending on what the platform, the system provides you with different um, ways to interact with. Like, for instance, on this chaos. Interactive, autant de support numérique que nous sommes amenés à utiliser au quotidien. À l'heure actuelle, une application doit être développée en fonction du support et du système d'exploitation. Le travail est donc tablette. considérable pour les développeurs. Donc, à l'avenir, tout pourrait être beaucoup plus simple. Ce nouveau type de programme, on peut l'appeler comme ça, en fait, il va résoudre justement ce problème. Donc il va permettre so guy aux équipes uh, de définir une faculté de l'application et le système va so permettre d'adapter par rapport à l'opérating system, mais aussi par rapport à la taille de l'écran. Bref, une seule application transposable de la vie, pour que le support numérique, une innovation capitale à entendre les développeurs d'applications. On ne sait pas, vous aujourd'hui, regardez les lunettes de Google, 
parce que demain, on devra aussi s'adapter par rapport à ça et avoir euh, des interfaces qui permettent de, de recevoir des commandes qui viennent de l'UNEP ou de proposer des, des interfaces qui publient de l'information sur, des, sur des, des plateformes tout à fait différentes. Le numérique touche tous les secteurs. Ce programme devrait donc permettre aussi des économies d'échelle colossales au minimum plusieurs centaines de millions d'euros. L'avenir, c'est aussi construire un site web simple en griffon. What you can do is that uh, this is what we are working right now. So instead of coding a user interface, we we let people sketch it. So imagine that you have a big table. This is a, uh, a very large table. People can sit around, maybe two, three, four, and then you give a stylus to an user. The user sketch the user interface that he or she wants. Like maybe uh, I want to have a home page here, a uh, home link there, a menu on the left, and some some stuff. And the system does automatically recognize for you what type of widgets and generates the code for you in the end. Once you have connected to data, of course. No. So here you can Is sketch this. Et so it's of course a rough sketch, but the system, system recognizes that for you dessin, and automatically generates your XML code and then it should be made up for it. You can see the, the table on the right. You can do that also with a collaborative version with people remotely working on that. Ces deux développements sont l'aboutissement de quatre années de travail de plus d'une centaine de chercheurs européens, le tout coordonné par l'UCL. Des développements majeurs qui pourraient avoir une grande influence dans cette frénétique évolution du monde numérique. Ok. Muito obrigado. Merci beaucoup pour votre travail.